what I want to do is be thoroughly pessimistic for a period. Um, in terms of philosophy, I'm a realist, not an idealist. Right? And if we're going to make progress, we kind of got to get real about a couple of things. So I want to challenge some of the current assumptions about AI, move on to some of the characteristics of humanity that we need to be aware of. And I'll do that very quickly over about 10 minutes. And I want to focus on what we're doing, looking at agency and meaning by looking at the world through the eyes of youth, right? And talk about that as a scalable process. Yeah? Um, the field is called naturalizing sense making. That's a, a field of sense making, not Karl Weick. It comes from a scientific tradition, which basically says, how do I make sense of the world so I can act in it? And the concept of action is key in the realization you never know enough to actually act fully objectively, but you can know enough to know what you should do. It's also known as anthrocomplexity, the application of complexity science to human systems, which is a new field which we're building at various universities in Wales at the moment. So a couple of things. I've been involved in enough think tanks in California and elsewhere over the last two to three years um, to have formed the very firm conclusion that at the moment artificial intelligence and social media form an existential threat to humanity and to democracy. Uh, I was at an OECD conference recently and people are just not taking account of the seriousness with which we can deal with things. One of the things I said in a conference in Washington 20 years ago, and this was before the internet took off and we were starting to look at the dangers of it, I said anything an algorithm can interpret, an algorithm can create. And we need to be aware of that. And before Trump, before Brexit, people didn't listen. Post-Trump, post-Brexit, people have started to listen extensively. And part of the problem we got here is the obsession with tools, the obsession with algorithms. I call them the sort of one algorithm to rule them all and in the darkness bind them school of thought, all right? If you recognize the scripture, you'll see it. So let's just look at some of the issues. Corruption of good intent. AI bots designed to improve people's mental health by allowing them to interact with them in real time have had a massive impact. Those same bots are now being used by criminals and by government intelligence agencies to cause mental breakdown in people on a distributed basis, targeted through hijacking their medical records and their Facebook profiles. People will always tell you about the good stuff, but they fail to tell you that criminals exploit this stuff a damn sight faster than good people, and we haven't got the inhibition in place, and that's a common one. What colleagues of mine at the University of Aberystwyth call neoliberalism. Yeah, basically, this comes a criticism of nudge economics, behavioral economics, yeah, starting to grab neuroscience and using it to augment political intent. And we can see that extensively. Um, good book on that subject. Um, in terms of human, a few things we keep forgetting about. First of all, we're still locked into our Cartesian model of consciousness. We think the human brain is a repository of consciousness. And that actually is really bad science. We now know that consciousness is a distributed function of the body, the brain, its tools, and its social interaction, now, what Andy Clark calls scaffolding. Yeah? We're far more than our brains, and our brains are far more than what we can do with an AI system. Now, our bodies are a part of that. Our sensory stimulation is a part of that. When people say we have a knowledge-rich world these days, we don't. We have a data-rich world, and that is a completely different thing. If you don't know it, pheromone traces are a key aspect of humans determining trust. We evolved to make decisions based on people about how they smell as much as what they say. If you reduce people to digital exchange, you make them anxious stutterers, to quote McIntyre, in their own existence. You reduce their stimulation, you don't increase it, even though it's distributed over wide networks. Material engagement theory. We now know that the tools we use actually change the physical structure of our brains and our bodies within one to two generations. We didn't develop the capacity for abstract number until the Sumerians created clay sanding tablets. We now know that culture inherits and we know the mechanism, it's the allele structure of RNA. That means if you put people in an impoverished environment over two generations, their children inherit negative characteristics. We're biological creatures, and there are implications for that 
that we need to pay account of. But the real danger is the danger of technology. The autism plague in the West is at least partially attributable to excessive use of technology. The neuroscience advice these days is not to let children to have more than half an hour to an hour a day on computer screens until at least five because the nature of the stimulation from that type of environment effectively triggers genes which are predisposed towards autism and we're creating a society which is autistic in its ability to handle judgment. And that's part of the problem with Trump and all those sort of things that come from it. Next one, we know from all of evolutionary history that domestication increases species variation but radically reduces resilience. If you look at native wolves, all right, there's three or four canine types. Domestic dogs, within seven generations, that's the number you get thousands, but genetically they're very weak. This is concerning us a lot about human beings in terms of the nature of variation coming in and the degree to which people are domesticated into tribes based on digital media. And finally, leading on to a couple of points, we know that identity requires a sense of belonging, a sense of place. That's a picture for where I feel at home in the mountains of North Wales. If we don't have a physical location, we become disembodied, we become disconnected. And the location to community through physical interaction is as important as the connection over the internet. Uh, and we've been neglecting that for some time, which means we're fundamentally forgetting a key aspect of human beings which is art came before language in our evolutionary history. Uh, music and painting come very early on, and our language evolved from abstractions, not from naming things. Now, that was an accident when it happened, like all evolution is an accident, but the value is by going up a level of abstraction, you can make novel connections between things. So when somebody in the 1940s notices that a chocolate bar melts in their pocket because they're maintaining the magneto of a radar machine and realizes the significance of it, we get microwave ovens. The basic cognitive process which allowed that novel connection to be made comes from our tradition as aesthetic creatures. And the current emphasis on STEM education in schools and the deprivation of people from art is actually a reduction of human intelligence in the way it works. If we become mere information processors and information regurgitators, which is what we're now seeing at university undergraduate level, we lose the capacity to be human in all too many ways. Now, I could give you a one-hour lecture on all of those, but I just want to flag those up um, because we're kind of like forgetting this in that we're becoming techno-fetishists. We become so obsessed with computers and digitalization that we haven't realized that it's a tool. And the point about a tool is when you pick it up, it should fit your hand. You shouldn't have to bio-re-engineer your hand, or worse still, bio-re-engineer your brain to fit the tool. Yeah, my argument is we're doing some of that. So let's talk about some of the stuff we're doing about this. The whole issue in this summarized, we need to engage people in a different way. I've talked about the existential democracy. It's because people aren't engaged. If you actually look at the Brexit vote, you look at the Trump vote, it, what we saw before that, and I could go on an apex predator theory here, you get the homogenization of the political parties. There is no difference between the political parties. No, it's no variety. Yeah, and that forms a form of commoditization. When you get no variety in the dominant form in an ecosystem, novelty emerges in the margins, and it can be very successful very quickly. We saw this in the Weimar Republic in the 1930s. Homogenization of the political tradition allows extremism to form. Yet if you don't have difference in human systems, you have a problem. And part of my argument against a lot of so-called enlightened thinkers is they want everybody to think the same, and they want everybody to think like them. And the danger is if you destroy variety, intellectual variety, traditional variety, tribal variety in humans, you give rise to a form of extremism. So what we're looking at is how do we engage people in their communities, how do we enact that engagement, uh, and really how do we empower people to the own it. So, I'll give you the background. Uh, this is a Welsh child, that's the national costume of Wales. It was imposed on us by the English 100 years ago, but we quite like it, so we've kept it, all right? 
Um, you may not know this, but Wales is the first country in the world to pass a Future Generations Act. No legislation can be passed by the Welsh Assembly unless it explicitly takes account of the needs of the next generation. And we actually have a Future Generations Committee who's responsible for enforcing that. Because we said as a nation, and there's only three million of us, but as a nation, if we don't take account of the needs of the future, if we just do shortism, it's a problem. So we need to make that primary legislation across everything we do. And the work we're doing is part of that. I've talked about the coercive power of social media. Yeah, people can be entrapped into processes here. It's actually really scary, and several other speakers have talked about that. We've also had a decade of developing distributed ethnography. Now, the principle of this is very simple. Ethnography is about the only research technique which gets to the heart of people. You can't trust questionnaires. You can't trust focus groups. Anything explicit will be gained, but we need to scale. And the origins of this work are in counterterrorism, working in, effectively in Washington before and after 9-11, where we needed real-time understanding of small changes in civilian populations in their attitude to legality, work which has gone on since. And the key insight we had, the key understanding we had, which I've talked about here before, is by making people ethnographers to their own condition, not only do you get better data, but you empower people to interpret their own narrative. So basically, people tell stories of their day-to-day -day lives, but they interpret that. So in one of the first big projects in Pakistan, school children across the whole of Pakistan found people in their grandparents' and their parents' generation and asked those people to tell the child the story of the adult's life that the adult thought the child should remember. Now, these are called sacred stories. They're really important in society. They're the transgenerational story transmission. And then the children help the adults interpret their own stories into a quantitative framework. Not an academic expert, not a computer algorithm, but the adult themselves provides the interpretation, which gives us a scalable quantitative approach. 50,000 self-interpreted micro-narratives in five days, in a physical representation which allowed us to look at underlying attitudes. And that technique has gone on and developed. Basically, by allowing children to interrogate adults and to interrogate their peers, we find out the day-to-day -day street stories of people's lives, which are far more significant than what they say to researchers or to pollsters. Yeah, I've been saying this for years. We're not listening to the street stories. We're not listening to the gossip outside the school gates. We're not listening to the stories in the pubs late at night, the stories told in the back of cats, taxis going home from a football match. Those are the stories that determine people's attitude, not the way that people perform for researchers or perform within groups. And there is massive criticism these days from anthropology for what's called participative action research or facilitator-led workshops because it privileges people who match the culture of the facilitator and the expectations of the facilitator. So we want to go beyond that. So, the first trial. Just complete after six months, successful trial completed, about to extend. Yeah. What we've done is we got into three of the impoverished valleys in South Wales. You can go onto this website, you can look at the results. And asked, gone through three separate areas, schools, community centers, and sports clubs, and given them the distributed ethnographic software to allow them to capture the stories that matter for them. For school teachers running the baccalaureate, this is a gift because it satisfies the requirement for social research, analytical capability and engagement all in one program. And the children can interview their adults. They can actually go out and look at things like isolated children looking after adults as solo care. They can look at isolated. We've done lots of projects on that. In one of the ones I most like, school children um, playing rugby. If you don't know, rug well, you know that rugby is a, is a Welsh national religion, right? Um, in terms of the way it works. Uh, the one thing that matters is we beat the English. I have rugby shirts for every nation that plays against the English so I can wear them at appropriate times, all right? It's an identity issue. Um, also, you need to understand that South Wales is a matriarchy. I grew up in South Wales. Basically, you are mildly scared of your wife, terrified of your daughter, petrified of your grandmother, 
And if your great-grandmother is distressed with you, you might as well leave the country and not come back for three generations, all right? That's the way it works. The tradition in the valleys is men hand over their wage packets to their wives on a Friday night, and they get given their beer money back. They do the hard work, the women look after the community. So what we found is that one of the things valleys girls are doing, because they don't have the money of Cardiff girls, it's an impoverished community, is they're using rugby, and their basic line is to say, we're fit, you pay for your beauty. That's the competition. Which means we've made radical reductions in childhood obesity, but also their agency has allowed them to go into old people's homes and gather the stories from the old people and start to work, make the old people fit as well. In Ferndale Community Arts Centre, by gathering narrative about how people experience that centre, we can then extend that into the community as a whole. So we're giving people tools that they find useful for ordinary purpose that we can then activate for extraordinary need. We're working with the day-to-day -day existence of people rather than grand schemes from a liberal enlightenment elite who want people to behave differently. And that's going to be really important as we go forward. There's a whole body of other projects which have gone on this. We're working, the parallel projects are working in Colombia, working through universities and through colleges, and there's a whole body of work going on there. And what it allows us to do is to start to come back to something Tom said, is to show how people's individual stories fit within a bigger picture, but not an explicit bigger picture. This is where we're looking at what are called fitness landscapes, and this is where we create a new mechanism for change. We've just actually been organizing in the valleys for people to run their own workshops with their own facilitators and ask questions on maps like these. How can we get more stories told like this and fewer stories told like that? And that is a whole new theory of change. What can we do tomorrow to create more stories like this, fewer stories like that? I can create a map for the whole of Wales, which a minister in parliament can look at, and he can say, what can I as a minister do to create more stories like this, fewer stories like that? And in Ferndale, the community centre can look at the narrative patterns for their own community and say, what can we as a community do today to create more like this, fewer like that? And that's kind of like called fractal ingredient. The other big area of development, and this is all coming into academic review, 9th of July in Cardiff University, is to present infographics to thousands of people and get them to interpret it in real time and show how different groups of people interpret the same data to identify sources of conflict and opportunities for reconciliation. This is from Peace and Reconciliation Work in Latin America, where we presented an infographic of the future of the country which has been interpreted by previous warring groups. And you can see immediately from this, there is absolutely no point in getting the blue and green guys to sit down and talk because they don't interpret the data in the same way. Trying to get them to talk about the conflict will make it worse, not better. We're now extending that to real-time polling of citizens and critically to participative budgeting where people can engage in mapping their underlying attitudes from which we can allocate funding rather than competing for scarce resource. So there's a body of new work coming out on this. But the principal idea is we need people to give real-time feedback in very large numbers in non-gameable ways. Now, one story that I want to complete. I was arguing this case 10 years ago when Obama came into the White House. And we said what we should be doing is capturing stories of people's lives, getting them to self-interpret it, then we can look at patterns in those stories and you can intervene to make a difference. But Silicon Valley didn't want to do that. They wanted to create a website where everybody would come up with ideas to be funded by the feds. So that's what they did. And of course then they had millions and millions of ideas, none of which could be funded. So they paid a polling agency millions to create a system to, for people to vote on which they like and didn't vote, yeah, which actually gave a huge amount of money to the lobby industry and they ended up radically distressed. You can't actually go down that explicit route of engagement because you haven't got enough resource and it will be manipulated just like everything else in social media is manipulated. If we'd actually run the project we're now running in Wales and Colombia, 
we would have looked for patterns of narrative and then government could have injected funding into those communities to create more stories like this and fewer stories like that on effectively a fractal micro-engagement basis. So what's our vision here? We're currently finishing off packaging this up so that any city or any nation can pick up and run the program. The idea is to make it a worldwide package. Right? We're talking with some funders about this, but basically it's already in the state where an individual city or a province could actually just pick it up and run it using the existing material. They just have to put a team engaged. And my vision on this is I want every child in every city in every country in the world to be a citizen journalist to their own communities on a monthly basis. So we've got a human interpreted, not a machine interpreted, narrative database in real time. And in complexity terms, what we're doing is putting a human buffer into the system. And if you don't know your basic science, an unbuffered feedback loop always ends up with perverted results. And that's what we're seeing with social media at the moment. It's an unbuffered feedback loop. So by creating human agency, we create a buffer. You know, people like the Red Cross are engaged in this as well, because if we've got a citizen journalist network, you get a natural disaster, you can activate that network. Yeah, but the whole concept is that allows people to see similarities and differences worldwide and for ideas to move horizontally rather than be mediated by agencies. So that's distributed ethnography, but then also critically just what's called distributed ideation. Ideas for change being generated not just bottom up or top down, but at all levels and visible and connected in real time. And with that, the concept of participation. But it has to be at scale. And this is what worries me. I hear of loads of initiatives which produce good results. Tom talked about one earlier. I could take you through hundreds of those, but they never scale. And the reason they don't scale is they involve too much facilitation, too much focus. What we're trying to shift to now is distributed systems that work across much larger volume very quickly. But we want to do it using the people themselves. The last thing we want is libertarian nerds who take Anne Rand seriously after puberty. Uh, if you know anything about the... Uh, and this is the problem we've got at the moment. Technology is being run by people who have a natural tendency to autism and a belief in libertarian or anarchy. And they're building systems, the blockchain is a problem on this, which we have no constraint that we can impose based on an ideological belief that constraint is of itself evil. Now, anybody who knows anything at all about ecosystems knows that without constraint, you don't get evolution. What we want are what are called enabling constraints, which are context-specific, rather than massive legal constraints, which are context-generic. And what we're working on here, effectively, is to create virtue through a series of small acts of empathy. More stories like this, fewer stories like that, engages you in people's lives in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. And I've deliberately used Plato and Aristotle here. Plato is pointing to heaven. He represents the idealists of the enlightenment, the belief that people will somehow get better. Aristotle is pointing to the earth. It's in day-to-day -day realities that we get change. And of course, the only thing we know for certain about any complex system is their unintended consequences. That's a cane toad. Now, if we know that, it means ethically, as a government, you are responsible for the consequences even though you couldn't predict them. And the bigger the intervention, the bigger the consequences, the bigger the unintended consequences. By creating a system based on fast real-time feedback loops with continuous small interventions, the unintended consequences can be managed if negative and amplified if positive. We need to use the nature of a system. And effectively, what I'm arguing for here is a form of symbiosis between technology and people. And at the moment, technology is a parasite, not a symbiote. Yeah, so until we start to engage as humans with technology, 
and realized that human intelligence is different from machine intelligence. We're not a poor form of information processing device. We actually evolved to make decisions in radically different ways. We will not get true augmentation. The danger is not that AI will exceed us in intelligence in the next 50 years. Well, actually it is, but the danger is at the moment we're planning to meet it halfway. We're reducing ourselves to follow rigid processes and regurgitate information using the web. I'm very sorry, computers will always be better at that. We have to find and rediscover the things we can do which are around knowledge and wisdom, not about information. Thank you very much for your time.